Okay, uh, well, um, hello. Please ask lots of questions. Um, so what I'm going to talk about, I'm going to talk about step, which is a density functional theory code. And we've got a flippant title, which is Kester, making money out of quantum mechanics. More seriously, in the context of this meeting, ah, it's stuck, that's why it's not working. Is it working now? Okay, yeah, fine, good. We can go back to real technology. Um, software, which I um, think is a great thing to um, think about for technology transfer because of all things trying to get it in the market, then actually we have a huge advantage on the software side compared to real widgets and real materials, which are very, very difficult. It's not easy, but it's a lot easier. Okay, so I'm going to first of all say a little bit about what ASTEP does. I know a lot of people in this room are familiar with density functional theory, so this is really a very, very quick run through just setting the scene for people who aren't familiar with the methodology, but also along the way making a few points about why at the time that PASTEP was being developed, it sort of turned into a candidate for something that one could consider commercializing. After that, I'll talk about uh, a little bit of my experience of working with the company that's now called Biovia, um, a software owner. And actually, when I saw the slide up earlier on, um, I think the thing to emphasize is that, and I'm sure this will be the case in, in many, many instances, not all, the partnership, okay? I'm an academic, I write quantum, sorry, people write quantum mechanicalization codes. When we started working with commercial partners, they brought something to the table, right? They brought a graphical user interface that meant that people could point and click and pull down crystal structures and set up calculations without writing in coordinates by hand. That had a huge impact in usability of code. And there's no way that I, as an academic developer of quantum mechanical modeling, wanted to do that task. So I could bring something to the table. The software owner, in this case, brought something to the table. And so it's not just, oh, he will go and sell it. It actually gaining things both ways. So, you know, it's something to look for if you're going down this particular route in choosing who you're going to work. What are they going to bring to you? What are you going to bring to them? And then because I've given over the years quite a number of talks about, you know, my experience of commercialization, I've got three slides at the end, which are just making a number of general points from my own experience about the process of commercialization. Um, so I'll just throw them and uh, you can what you like about them. Okay, so just a very, very quick introduction to quantum mechanical and modeling and density functional theory, okay? So the point about quantum mechanics is it's a predictive method. It's one parameter theory, and that parameter was set by Planck back in 1900. So it's been unchanged for a very long time. It's never failed, and we know how to go from classical mechanics to quantum mechanics, okay? So, quantum mechanics provides you the absolute dream that you know nothing about any system, but you can specify the quantum mechanical equations, and then you just have to solve them, and that way you can predict about all these materials you've never made before you have to go and make them and do an experiment expensive and difficult thing. Okay, lovely idea. As Paul Dirac pointed out, look, we've done it all. Actually, I love this thing about this with Dirac, okay? You know, we've got laws of quantum mechanics, so we can do the whole of chemistry, but only some of physics, because chemistry is so trivial. He didn't even mention biology, because that's even a trivial subset of chemistry, all right? All right so, we, yeah, we've solved everything, basically. The difficulty is only in the fact we can't solve the equations, which I think is really quite amusing. Um, actually, to be fair to Dirac, that's only half the quote, because he then presciently said, it would be really good if we get an approximate that, that works well enough. Okay, he knows we're throwing out true quantum mechanics, but finding something that works. And if you're not familiar with density functional theory, or you're fed up scientists trying to blind you with how brilliant density functional theory is, density functional theory is just a completely lucky fluke that provides your approximate practical method. Okay, um, 
So it started in 1954 with a thing called the Home Bell Congress, where they basically said that actually if you're just looking at atomistic systems and you're trying to do the quantum mechanics associated with the electron, you can do everything exactly with single particle density. Obviously much, much less complex than the many body wave function, which is a reason you can mechanical equation. Um, and it's essentially existence proof for this extra bit that added to that charge density interacting with the Coulomb potential of the ion cores gives you the total energy of the system. Okay, so it's an existence proof that this exists. And then you just search over single particle densities uh, for the system you're interested in, and you get the exact ground state energy and the exact ground state density, which is brilliant and trivially easy. To but there's a but. In fact, there's a big but, which is... Density functional theory is an existence proof. It doesn't tell you what that functional is. In fact, it takes about five seconds to explain to people that there is no. It does stop lots of chemistry to define it, but never mind. Uh, okay, so lovely idea, but absolutely useless. So what we did was a year later, Sham. Formulated the problem. Actually, I always take this from Sam Edwards, one of Sam Edwards who was Cambridge professor when I was first a student in Cambridge, uh, and he had this wonderful Welsh accent. And uh, one thing I remember him saying is that if you have got something you know absolutely nothing about, replace it with a larger number of things you know absolutely nothing about, and that's called progress. And that's exactly what the cone sham trick is. We take this unknown functional. Replace it by the kinetic energy function we know absolutely nothing about. Exchange relation function we know absolutely nothing about. And this is the Coulomb interaction of the electron density with itself, which we do know something about. That's the Hartree interaction. And this is where the lucky flukes come in. Okay? So what Coney Chan did was said, well, look, I can't get the kinetic energy. If I write wave functions, I know quantum mechanically what the kinetic energy is. I still got this, which I know absolutely nothing about. But fortunately, approximate this with incredibly crude approximations and get, in many cases, predictions of physical and chemical and all sorts of other properties to within a few percent. But it's uncontrolled. So sometimes it's hundred percent or a thousand percent out and one never quite knows. Okay? So you'd have thought that, wow, we know how to do quantum mechanics, but of course it had absolute not a density functional theory citation. Talk about density functional theory. Remember, Homburg Cone was 64, Homburg Cone Sham was 65. Um, there were hardly any papers talking about density One of them was probably that people actually were doing density functional theory but didn't bother putting down as keywords because you cared, right? Um, but it didn't have much of an impact. And the reason for that is that we weren't yet at the stage showing that it really allowed you to predict properties of materials. It's difficult to find, you know, what was the pivotal paper that transformed this field and said you can calculate real materials. Um, perhaps it's this Yin and Cohen paper in 1982. They looked at different structures of silicon and germanium, so different putative crystal structures, varied the volumes, and showed that structures is called the tangent is the uh, phase transitions is of course the phase transition under pressure where you're predicting the transformation to be to tin and the slope of that curve has to give you the pressure that that transformation is based. Okay, and now you've got things, you've got predictions that you can actually look against. Data suddenly found that despite the huge approximations in these sorts of calculations, it actually was beginning to work. Okay. All right, so these were predictions, but it didn't take very long to start making predictions with density functional theory. Okay, so now we could do real, real materials. Did much happen? Well, not really very much. You know, a few more papers, you know, moving up and moving up, but not really taking off. Okay, so then the next sort of thing in the development of this field was the so-called Carparanello method, which may actually people are now too young to actually sort of uh, remember the famous Carr Paranello in nine, method in 1985. But, you know, this is when I joined the field, and for a period of time, it was the only thing that people were talking about. It basically was a transformation of the way that you solve the equations to make things faster. Okay? So we went from being able to do about two atoms to about ten or so atoms with this technique. And everyone said, oh, let's transform the field. Did it transform the field? Well not in terms of the number of papers that were published. 
by very much. Yeah, it's all creeping up very, very slowly and surely. And of course, I'm going to be completely and utterly biased talking about what changed the field. But one of the things that helped to change the field was we simply, okay, so this is a really work of my co-authors, Mike Peter and Doug Allen at Corning, um, who were also developing this methodology when I started developing it at MIT. Um, and Mike Peter in particular was sort of into numeric analysis and things like that. And so together we developed a conjugate gradient method for doing the minimization problem that you have to do for the functional theory calculation. And that made a huge difference because it meant that actually you were bound to converge and you didn't have to choose parameters to make it converge. You didn't have to get the output of each iteration and look at it to see it was not converging, which is what a lot of people did. And suddenly, a lot more people could start accessing the methodology. We then, with other people, um, ported the codes onto uh, parallel computers in the very early days. So we were able to go up to 400 atoms of silicon, a nice easy atom to do, but also it meant you could do lots of atoms of other types as well. We're able to look at uh, dislocations in silicon. We were actually able to do a dynamical simulation of an entire reaction at the point when the chemist was stuck on three electrons. So we were doing 100 atoms looking at a chemical reaction as you take place in the computer using quantum mechanics, where quantum chemistry was doing about three electrons. And all together, one might argue, that, and of course other people were doing similar things. Well, no, they weren't, because we were the first on the parallel computers and really led the field in that respect. But at that stage, you started getting an enormous increase in the use of density functional theory. People saw that it could actually answer a lot of real-world problems that may be relevant to their own research interests. Right, so hopefully I'm not going to have to convince anyone in this room, but it's all about the software, okay? So that... Um, the calculations I showed, um, the Eamon Cohen ones, 82, they were basically two atoms. That was the largest unit cell used for any of their calculations. Okay? And a decade later, we did our 400 atom silicon surface calculation. Um, if you stayed, well, actually, if you stayed with the methodology, the software, the numerical method that existed in 1981, you could never have done that calculation ever because they just wouldn't converge on larger systems. But let's be generous. I mean, it's a naturally cubic scaling technique, but as you got to larger systems, it was harder and harder to convert. So let's say something like um, cortex scaling, n to the fourth. Going from there to there is at least 10 to the eight times as much computational effort, and that's probably a slight underestimate. Over that decade, of course, we had Moore's Law. It brought you about 100 increase in hardware capability. So all the rest of this transition from academically, interestingly, but commercially irrelevant calculations to real possible industrial interest was all driven by making your numerical methods better, hardening the techniques, making things more efficient, looking at scaling, using new hardware. The hardware was enabler. Certainly, the second important thing, the thing that was really important during this decade, was the transition from, say, vector supercomputing for the biggest machines to parallel computing, where you suddenly got access to enough memory to do something useful. So we end up with CASTEP and other density function theory codes, where you could do the whole periodic table, hundreds of atoms. Forces come out very nicely with plane wave pseudo-potential calculations, so you can take an arbitrary geometry and then relax the atoms to their zero force positions, and so do structural optimization. You could do dynamics, although on time scales that are very, very, very short, and many scientific questions could be uh, turned into density functional theory or sequence of density functional theory calculations. But with all the things that I just talked about, you have easy access to technology. And I think Gerhard is right in the surveys where it says easy access is not very high priority. I think that is from the viewpoint of if it wasn't easy, I wouldn't have put the software in the first place, so why are you even asking me the question? Okay. So what do I mean by easy access to technology? No variable parameters, that's what we buy with quantum mechanics. So that's a nice thing. 
robust, efficient numerical techniques, so you don't have to take every single iteration and look at it and change a convergence parameter. And in principle, you can just throw your atoms into a unit cell and press a button and get a density functional theory calculation done. And those things are certainly you know, quite attractive for non-specialist academics to begin to do density functional theory calculations. That's some of the rise we saw post-1990 in the use of density functional theory and the number of uh, papers published each year. But of course, it's the same set of ingredients that actually makes this of interest to industry, commercial partners. So, let me now move on to talking about my own experiences of working with a commercial software owner. So why did I even entertain this? Um, well, it was really sort of forced upon us because we developed this sort of you know, suite of codes that was you know, being used more and more widely and that takes a lot of effort to support users and train users and so on. And our wonderful funding council decided that that wasn't worth funding, so they decided not to fund us any further for further development of the code. Okay, well, fair enough, that's their sort of view. So there's no interest in commercialization actually to bring in some money that we could then use to fund a postdoc to carry on doing that work of supporting a community of users. Okay, so that was really the first thing that we thought of in terms of going out to commercial partners. We are talking prehistory here, okay? This is the 1990s. In fact, if you go into the 1980s in Cambridge, there was a general feeling that if an academic talked to industry, at least if they were in the physics department, that they were probably compromising their academic credentials, okay? I mean, to give you a precise quote, I was in lunch in one of the colleges in the mid-1980s, and a fellow in chemistry walks in and sits down opposite me, and he says, is it true that the Cavendish professor is researching dog food? Splutter, splutter. And of course he was. A brilliant Sam Edwards again, and he found a brilliant way of working with industry, bringing vast sums of money to fund research, true genuine academic research, by basically making the links between the sort of problems that industry has and the sort of fundamental understanding that academics have. And he you know, was amazing at doing that. And so, yes, he was actually helping people to understand problems involving flow of materials in dog food. There's nothing wrong with it, okay? Um, things are changing. I mean, and things are radically changed now in the UK. We're now sort of under enormous pressure to actually make uh, some sort of commercial impact or impact outside academia of our work. But uh, I mean, this building here and the huge science park across the road, you know, they were in their very early days um, back then. Uh, so it's back, you know, almost at the time where, you know, as an academic, you didn't go and talk to industry. It wasn't kind of done the, the done thing. Also, because it was so long ago then, and because technology transfer, at least in the UK, in this sort of subject area, was something that wasn't very common, then not very much was known about software licensing and how to actually arrange things, okay? So it was really the one leading the blind when we started talking to companies. So we went round to a number of potential commercial partners, uh, software owners, um, and I mean, I don't think there was actually a great, I mean, there's always this idea, I've got this wonderful software, you know, I'm going to have these companies straight, and they was actually offering more and more money to actually license my, well, not actually like that, you know, if you're lucky, you might find one partner who wants to actually license your product. Um, maybe if you've got some software so absolutely brilliant that, you know, everyone wants it, then of course you can go to bidding war, but uh, I don't think that uh, we actually got approaches, serious approaches from more than one company. You go and see quite a number. Um, so that company was originally called Cambridge Molecular Design. It spun out of materials department in Cambridge, originally doing mainly polymer modeling, and in fact, they, their offices were here. Yeah. Um, and that's where I first started visiting them. And they had 
a number of people who worked in the, the Cavendish and the physics department um, working part-time with them. So actually they, they, they claimed that they were aware of the sort of work that was going on in Cambridge in density functional theory. Okay. And yeah, they survived, particularly over the sort of, you know, from the Cambridge molecular design to molecular simulations. Did that company survive? Is there brilliant science? But the main reason they survived was because, and we are talking about a long, long time ago now, they survived because they had a graphical user interface that was absolutely brilliant, that allowed people to get access to the science through you know, interfaces rather than command line. Okay, now it's trivial. I mean, everyone does that. But back then, this was really leading edge um, innovation software. I don't think we really appreciated that at the time, but actually that was a crucial part of the success of our licensing. Okay, so say we, you know, it wasn't an awful lot of experience of software licensing at the time, you know, blindly in the blind. So the original license that we actually negotiated with Molecular Simulations um, really, I mean, allowed me and my research group and collaborators to use the code, but it was very restrictive on use the code and you will see changes to that um, on later slides. Okay, first point of warning. Okay, if you're of a nervous disposition, turn away at this point. There is not a single license negotiation or trivial change to any agreement involving CASTEP that has taken less than 18 months to negotiate, okay? It just takes a hugely long time. The idea, I've got this great piece of software, I walk in, we sign, a walk out, it's all going to take, you know, five hours, six hours at most. It's not like that. It takes a huge amount of time to get anywhere, okay? So, so the license deal, well, actually, I think <laughs> Nurture Simulations, I think, made the, the sales of the product before we'd actually signed a formal license or something like that. Um, so we got the license, I think, finished in 1995. Um, what about the first five years? Well, first five years, um, there had been a massive growth in the atomistic molecular modeling market. You had a lot of people going around saying, you never need to do another experiment again. And quite a lot of companies were taken in by this complete lie, uh, classic overselling. Um, and then, of course, reality hit. Um, as a result, you know, the market collapsed. There were two top-end companies, so molecular simulations, there was a company called Biosim. Uh, their product ranges were pretty well identical. Um, during the downturn, the only way you can actually sort of really get one over on the opposition if your products are very similar is by cutting the price. So basically, they were cutting each other's throats by undercutting the pricing of each other. There's only two ways this thing solves, sorts out. Either you both go bankrupt or you merge. Fortunately, they sensibly merged. So now we come to an interesting thing, because Biosim had a plain wave pseudopenitential code. It was called plain wave. It was actually written by researchers at Corning Glass. Okay? Castet was that code that originally started with us at MIT, developed in Cambridge. The big difference is Biosim's code, in fact, Biosim had been bought by Corning Glass a number of years before, because they saw actual modeling is the future. It's how we're going to make lots and lots of money, um, particularly with the downturn in the um, dot-com market and all the things associated with that, like internet. Um, so they, Biosim, had plain wave code for free, and Molecular Simulations were actually paying royalty on Castep. So your two companies are merging, you've got to rationalize your product range. You've got one that you pay money for, one that you don't pay money for. Which one do you go ahead with? Oh, come on. <laughs> we all talk about commercial opportunities. Right. Well, they didn't. Why didn't they? They didn't because of a number of factors. So, Plain Wave 
was supported by two research in Sincorn in Glass, actually the co-authors on that conjugate gradient paper, so Mike Teacher and Doug Allen. Um, lecture simulations were supported by the whole of the electronic structure side of the theory of dense matter group in the Cavendish Laboratory and numerous collaborators, which meant that we had lots and lots of people coming through who could be taken on either by molecular simulations or by companies if they wanted to go into this area. Um, also, we've done lots and lots of different applications to lots and lots of different systems. So when you're going into a metal company like Alcoa and you say, we've got this wonderful method called density functional theory and we can do anything. And they say, well, have you got a calculation of the metal? They say, um, no, but we've got this lovely calculation of window glass, because we're calling. Okay? Well, take away, you know, the only thing you had in the literature was actually calculations on silica, silicon dioxide, and virtually nothing else. As Casper, if they said, well, have you done a metal? Yeah, we've done a metal. Have you done a uh, semiconductor? Yeah, we've done a semiconductor. Have you done a surface? Have you, yeah. have you done a chemical reaction? Yeah, we've done a chemical reaction. Have you done a defect in any of these? Yeah, we've done all those. Have you done a... You know, a mineral? Yeah, we've done minerals. Every time, every application area, there was already literature, academic literature, publications showing the capability of the methodology. So for both of those reasons, plus I have some good mates in the company, which probably helps as well, um, they went with Castep rather than Plain Wave. Okay? Right. Next important thing, okay, we licensed in 1995, I can't remember if it was 1997 or 1998, the first sort of product manager was appointed. I think the whole of sort of quantum, you know, this guy just took on Castep, and he was amazing, a guy called Keith Glassford, he, you know, and he pushed the sales, he really, really pushed the sales, and they absolutely jumped when he was appointed. But that costs... So if you are going to aggressively sell and support a product, it costs. <coughs> and you have to remember that when you think about the whole of commercialization of software. Okay? I've talked about the fact that we have very limited um, academic distribution rights in the original agreement, so we negotiated a thing called the UKCP agreement, which basically allowed distribution of CASTEP to all UK academics in return for some code development effort, okay? And that was another license negotiation, and it took at least 18 months, if not longer, okay? Oh, but what happened? Well, quite honestly, this was kind of like academic software development to be all, yes? Um, and I probably shouldn't say this, but I'm being recorded, it's going to go up on the website, so it can be redacted and things like that. But actually, Despite all best efforts, the software development effort during this period was incredibly haphazard. You know, some of it was done by Lex Simulations in-house. We had academic groups, including under this UKCP agreement. But also, Lex Simulations got in other commercial companies to do development of the code. And that might have been all all right, except, you know, there wasn't version control, you didn't have repositories and, you know, a commercial company would take the code and then spend three years, say, parallelizing it and hand it back and say, oh, here it is. Well, you've got three years of further development of the code. And so, over this period, the code became undevelopable. And I'm not sure if this is what really is meant by technical debt. debt. I saw in one of your reports, but it sounds like a flash term, so I thought I'd use it. Okay. So Castep should have died, right? Castep, actually, when we were doing the original license negotiation, it was sort of stated that Castep would have a 10-year lifetime um, and sell $5 million, I think. And if it hadn't been for what happened next, that would have been pretty well on track, okay? So how did it change? Well... And this is where luck comes in. Okay, a huge amount of luck. Okay, so in my research group and with a number of collaborators, there was a group of younger researchers. Six of them. Bill Linden was there very much at the beginning, kicked the thing off, but then left academia. He's now a lawyer, and Keith Refson joined later on from actually STFC from the, the Rutherford Lab. Um, 
And they decided that, oh, we love this density functional theory. You know, they were software developers. They wanted to extend the capability of density functional theory calculations. It wasn't possible with the old cat step we do with mess. So they said, let us write a properly software engineered plain ray pseudo-potential code, and it was not going to be cat step. Okay? That was not what they started out doing. They wanted something to drive their own academic research. Okay? What they did is really quite remarkable because they were also students, postdocs, or moving to academic positions at the time. And so in their spare time, when they were doing the day job, they completely rewrote the CASTEP code. Um, now, America tried doing the same thing with their nuclear weapons codes. People probably may not remember the story of the ASCII um, program. So ASCII, do you remember the ASCII red, ASCII purple, ASCII white computers? So all the people in the room will remember that. Well, the ASCII program was a billion dollar program to re-engineer the nuclear weapons codes when the test ban treaty came in. Okay? So everyone, well, if you look back over the top 500 list, you'll see those names earlier on. So people recognize the ASCII computers. Okay? In fact, the ASCII computers were only a third of the cost of the program. Another third was on software licenses, and electricity, and so on to run the machines. But a third, third, a third of the program was to re-engineer the 12 nuclear weapons codes. So basically it's $25 million a shot. Code teams of between 8 and 15 people, five years to do it, and 10 out of the 12 projects failed. So US spends $25 million per code, gets a failure rate of whatever it is, 83%. UK, six people in the part-time do exactly the same job and succeed. Do we triumph this? No, never heard it mentioned once. It is absolutely pathetic. Um, and actually is one of the real problems of software that the people who are really good at it so often don't get acknowledged, okay? It became clear given that old Castet was going to die, that it would be very sensible if this plain wave pseudo-potential code with proper software engineering became Castet, but that required a further license negotiation. And I had three miserable years trying to prevent these two groups of people killing each other and walking away. Eventually, it, it, it all worked out, okay? And that changed the model, okay? So... From that point on, the code development primarily carried out by that set of researchers, called themselves the CASTEP Developers Group. And I flagged this as this is the way to do software development. High quality, properly software engineered code in academia means you can both easily develop your functionality. If people are used to the idea of technology readiness levels as a scale from you know, initial breakthrough in the lab to rocket launch. Um, so one is initial breakthrough in the lab, so your new functionality is what we call technology readiness level one. Commercial sales is technology ready level, readiness, level, readiness level nine. And if you have properly engineered software, your code can be at both simultaneously, which is that point I made earlier on about software has huge advantages in technology transfer. If you do a widget in the lab, you have to make 10 widgets, and then 100 widgets, and then 1,000 widgets, and it all costs a huge amount of money to take yourself up to commercial scale uh, production, and that's hugely expensive. Software, if you do it properly, you don't have to do that, but you do have to do it properly, and that's a, a big issue. Okay. Further developments, um, yet more Mergers, acquisitions, and all the rest of it, electric simulations after numerous other mergers and acquisitions, renamed itself Axaris in 2001. And there was about 10 years where actually things became, well, we're, we're fine. I mean, we got them well. Um, the Castep developers did their job, and Axaris did their job, and it all worked very, very well. Um, but, you know, things always are a bit rocky. Um, and you know, about 10 years after this, there were a number of years of a fairly sort of difficult relationship, um, which ended, and part of that difficulty was the fact that Axaris wanted to sell itself. And so we're looking for someone to, to buy them, 
and that meant that a lot of the attention was on how do we set ourselves up for a sale rather than how do we carry on maintaining what we've got. Anyway, this culminated with Axaris being bought by Dasso System in 2004. And actually, at this point, I thought, at last. So, for the whole of this period, and I'm sure Gerhardt will, will be able to say the same. I mean, materials modeling, like, oh, that's the poor relation. Yes, there, there, never mind. You know, materials, how boring. Because all the money is going to be made from biology and pharmaceuticals. So you're just here to keep a little bit of an income flow while we do the big stuff, okay? And I hate to think how many initiatives there were in biology and, you know, combinatorial chemistry that all bit the dust while the little materials just sort of chugged on. It was never very big, but it kept on delivering sales every single year. And then finally you're taken over by Dassault System and you think, oh wow, finally, an owner who understands materials, right? And then what do they call the company? Biovia! I couldn't believe it! Bio! What? I swear, what? Right. Working with a partner is never, ever straightforward. Things change, okay? And actually things change in industry on a much shorter time scale than they do in academia. So, just when you think it's all going very well, you'll find that something comes and sideswipes you. Okay? So, because it's a new owner, we need to find the license negotiation. This one took about three years, I think, or four. Um, because DASO systems have a way of, you know, licensing product. To be fair to them, they have been very, very adaptable, but it has been quite a long time because it, we are very different from their normal model of how they in license software. Um, one of the warnings, and I think Gerhard did mention this, okay, so part, as part of this, the Castor Developers Group had to show that every line of Castor um, by ever had a right to actually sell. So they had to prove ownership or right to use for every line of code. Anyway, we have just completed the, the license that's been signed. There are a number of con effects taking part. Um, there's going to be much more liberal um, academic use of the code. Um, because we've only just signed, hopefully, you know, we only have a, well, through Tasso System, there's a massive sales force, very professional sales force. So we are hoping for an uptick in sales, but as we've only just signed it, it's too good to see what's going to happen. So that was my relationship with the software owner, which is one of the reasons my hair has turned grey. General advice about commercialization, okay? So I'll click through these. I think some of those uh, you, you've had before, but, you know, as I said, I've been doing talks about commercialization at the time. Um, so let's just say some things, okay? So some of you are talking, oh, I just want people to use the software. Fine, but please do make sure, one, that people can't steal it and just turn it into their own and start selling it completely like you, or at least you know how you please. So, and not all of you are maybe from university uh, that have technology transfer offices, but anything that is about negotiation or legal advice, okay? You know, if you're like me, you're an academic, you know, you, you, you may know a little bit about these things, but you're not an expert, so get help, okay? I think I emphasize this. The transformation density functional theory calculations from you know, into things that were much easier to use, relatively robust, accessible. To me, if you don't have software like that, like that, I would be very surprised if most companies, or at least the companies I've come into contact with, would be very interested in using it. Okay, so think about that, and that means making compromises. Okay. So, um, you know, instead of sort of, you know, worrying about things very precisely, just sort of generic labels about the level of accuracy. It's the sort of thing that will be received well in the company, even though academics probably don't like the idea of being able to say something as imprecise as coarse or standard or high levels of accuracy. As I hope I've made clear, this takes a huge amount of time, all right? Do not naively think, oh, it'd be nice if my stuff was commercialized and just sort of, you know, go down that route without realizing that, that even, yeah, look, we are, 
All the commercial sales of, of, of Castep are done by the company, okay? But even that sort of hands-off process, there's a huge amount of things we need to be support or back up. So, you know, it takes time. Just negotiations take time, okay? Um, accept that it's going to take time. I hope I've emphasized that if you've done your software well in the first place, then in fact, you know, there's not a huge amount of additional work that needs to be done, okay? And so it's not as distracting as, say, trying to take some experimental device into the marketplace where that's hugely, hugely challenging and most of what you'll be doing has got absolutely nothing to do with academic research. Software licenses always been made. I mean, you, you could have two entire days talking about software licenses. I'm not going to show it, say anything more. Okay, just think carefully right from the beginning about licenses because, as you know, I mean, they're infectious licensing. They're things that, you know, use a bit of code and suddenly the whole of your code becomes the same. You know, they're not all like that, but just be aware that licensing is a complex issue and, you know, Take advice. I don't know. Is MC going to set up advice on licensing? Is that one of its tasks? And so we have uh, yeah, some, some training on that yeah. and uh, paper yeah. on that. Yeah. Yeah. On yeah. Okay. Good. Okay. So the best advice. Remember I said when we started thinking about commercializing Castet, it was just to support a postdoc in my group. Yeah. You know, to then carry on looking after users and developing and so on. Um, the best advice I ever got in my life was from someone who actually worked in the company here for a time, who said, whatever you do, if you're licensing a product, get a royalty, okay? He said, okay, we've got a postdoc, but get a royalty as well. It doesn't matter how little it is, get a royalty, okay? And he was absolutely right, okay? You know, if sales really take off, probably you want to see that, whether it's back into a non-profit type of system where it's used to support the research effort or whether it's to sort of reward the people who contribute towards it, whatever. Make sure you get tied in to the success of it, okay? Um, so royalty is important. You know, how do you tell, sorry, how do you tell that, that they're really interested? Well, you know, maybe there should be an upfront fee, you know, and so an upfront fee to give you the right to be able to sell it, plus a royalty on sales, or you can essentially do the same using a royalty agreement with, with a guaranteed minimum annual payment. So, you know, don't just hand your thing over and, um, you know, there's got to be some incentive for the company to actually develop code. I mean, the history is littered with big companies taking over products with the only intention being of killing them, all right? Don't wander in saying, oh, big company, nice people. No, big company, nasty people want to kill me, all right? Particularly if I'm going to endanger their lovely, lucrative, awful piece of code, all right? They will take the software and they will kill you, all right? So this stops them doing that, okay? So it's important that you actually think about that. And that's the thing I emphasized before, software does not sell itself, okay? It needs to have someone selling it, it needs to have someone supporting it. All of this costs an awful lot of money, okay? And a lot of academics think, well, I did all the hard work, I did all the innovation, I should get all the money. Well, no, you won't, okay? Um, but the more mature your product is, i.e. the closer to the market it is, the higher the level of royalty you can negotiate, okay? But, but please don't go in saying, oh, I should get 50% of sales because you'll survive exactly five minutes in your first meeting with any commercial company. So there's no way they can, can actually support the code if you're taking that much away from it. If you want to go that route, do it yourself, okay? Ah, uh, have already mentioned this, you know, Always involve experts, okay? When you're negotiating with big, nasty companies, all right, they have lots and lots of money to pay for people who are experts in negotiation tactics, pressure tactics, nasty tactics, undermining tactics. You're a little academic, okay? So get, your, get some help, okay? 
Um, and the thing that's remarkable, okay, you may not have a university technology transfer office, um, but a lot of the funding agencies now are beginning to provide support. EMMT, you've just heard, is here to provide support. Um, angel investors, you know, so entrepreneurs, say, who've made some money and now invest for, well, fun, and they'd like to get some more money, but really for fun. It is amazing how many angel investors and entrepreneurs will give you huge amounts of time for free because they just like the ecosystem. Um, so there are a lot of people around who can help, and I'm sure EMMC can help as well. I think that's the end of what I wanted to say, so hopefully you've got some questions. <laughs> Thank you very much, guys. Um.